But these are our main stories. Israel says there'll be no electricity, water or fuel for Gaza until all Israeli hostages are freed and that it will fight Hamas until it's destroyed. Just as ISIS was crushed, so too will Hamas be crushed. They should be spit out from the community of nations. As America's top diplomat vows unending U.S. support for Israel, some of the hundreds of thousands of Gazans left homeless by Israeli airstrikes seek refuge in hospitals already overwhelmed by casualties. Every corner of the compound, there are families on mattresses, and it literally is a scene of desperation. Also in this podcast... A film by the world's biggest music star, Taylor Swift, breaks records before it's even released. Aid agencies are warning that Israel's total blockade of Gaza in response to Hamas's devastating attack on Saturday could lead to its hospitals turning into morgues. As we record this podcast, the International Committee of the Red Cross says that with electricity, fuel and water cut off, Hospitals could run out of fuel for their backup generators in the next few hours. But despite that warning, Israel says it will not end its siege until Hamas releases every single one of the dozens of hostages it's taken. More than 1,300 people were killed in the surprise Hamas attack, including foreign tourists, festival goers and children. The Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, held a joint news conference with the American Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, in Tel Aviv, in which he pledged to defeat Hamas. The massacring of young people in an outdoor music festival, the butchering of entire families, the murder of parents in front of their children and the murder of children in front of their parents, the burning of people alive, the beheadings, the kidnappings, And the sickening display of celebrating these horrors, the celebration and glorification of evil. President Biden was absolutely correct in calling this sheer evil. And just as ISIS was crushed, so too will Hamas be crushed. They should be spit out from the community of nations. No leader should meet them. No country should harbor them. And those that do should be sanctioned. We'll hear more from that news conference in a few moments' time. But first, let's get a sense of what's happening in Gaza. With more than 1,300 Gazans killed and more than 300,000 left homeless by retaliatory Israeli airstrikes, many trapped in the sealed-off enclave with no exit routes have sought refuge in the territory's already overstretched hospitals. Dr. Ghassan Abu Sita is a British doctor working in Gaza. He recorded this update about what it's like on the medical front line. I've just been asked to um, go to the emergency department to see a patient. When you walk to the emergency department, you're now walking through hundreds, if not thousands, of families that have taken up every corner uh, of the compound, the Shifa. These families have come here um, to escape the bombing and to try to find a uh, safe place. Literally every corner of the compound, there are families on mattresses, and it literally is a scene of desperation. The bombing has not stopped for a single uh, hour. Every few minutes, the buildings in the hospital are shaken by shells, uh, and the sounds of, um, of bombings happening in the, uh, nearby. Before I came here, I had to take this young woman to surgery whose entire family had been wiped out in an uh, air raid in the northern part of Gaza. She has multiple uh, blast injuries, shrapnel uh, uh, injuries. We've been able to take her to the OR Uh, now, even though she was injured a couple of days ago, because there's such a big pressure on the operating rooms that only the the most critically injured are getting access to the operating rooms. Dr. Ghassan Abu Sita, our correspondent, Rushdi Abu Alouf, is also in Gaza and has been assessing the damage 
caused by Israeli airstrikes. Overnight there was more airstrikes and this morning the health ministry said about 50 people were killed. One of the uh, significant targets were in a refugee camp in Gaza City is called Beach Camp and they said Israeli airstrike destroyed two houses and many civilians were killed. I was passed by the hospital this morning. A queue of long ambulances are waiting to deliver the uh, uh, casualties to the emergency room where hospitals are overwhelmed by the uh, number of uh, people injured. The hospital are appealing for people to donate blood. They said we are running out of essential uh, medical equipment and they said we are running out of fuel. Israel cut the electricity uh, on Saturday and the only power station that was providing a little bit of power for the essential services has been stopped yesterday due to the uh, fuel uh, shortages and that caused a severe uh, disruption to the uh, water uh, network to Gaza. So most of the houses, they don't have water in their, in their houses. I was passing by uh, a street where hundreds of people were gathered around uh, a tank, a water uh, tank, and people were queuing to fill the, uh, their, uh, their bottles. Talking to those people, the, what, the, what, what, what the most they are worried now is the news of Israeli uh, bringing tanks near the, near the border for, and a possible a ground operation. People lived this experience back in 2014 when Hamas and Israel were fighting uh, street to street and house to house in several locations across uh, near the border and thousands of people were killed, hundreds of houses were destroyed. So the people, they knew what's the meaning of having Israeli tanks in a densely populated refugee camp and densely populated uh, neighborhood. Rushdi Abu Luf in Gaza. Well, Rushdi mentioned there the speculation that Israel is preparing to launch a ground invasion of Gaza. Our correspondent Dan Johnson reports now on the response in Israeli society, beginning with people he spoke to in Tel Aviv. On a street corner here by the Expo Center, there are loads of goods that have been donated, being boxed up by volunteers. Uh, This is stuff to support the military or things that are being sent, clothes and shoes, to support people from the south of the country who've lost their homes, lost everything. What's your name? Lyle. Why are you here? What's happening, Lyle? Everybody here, you see, work in a regular job. And we just leave everything and come here and do whatever it takes to help those in need. It's very emotional and it's a very hard time for Israel. The humanitarian response has been very focused and national unity is being invoked by Israel's Prime Minister, who now leads an emergency wartime government. But when it comes to the next military steps, Israelis are still considering the options. If you hear that the military has gone into Gaza, how would you feel about that? I would feel good because the people that has been kidnapped should be taken home. I wouldn't feel good that our army is getting in there because probably there'll be losses. But Hamas should be destroyed. They should be eliminated, uh, period. At the heart of this conflict is land. Who controls it and how it is divided. We've just passed through a checkpoint in the barrier, the wall that separates Israelis and Palestinians near Jerusalem. And this is the occupied West Bank, part of the land Palestinians living here want for a state of their own. And we're driving up to Efrat, a Jewish settlement. It's considered illegal under international law, but Israel disputes that. Sarah Blackcharm runs Healthy, a company she started during the pandemic that cooks and sends out individual meals to people's homes. She's lived here for 15 years. This is our storage room with all of our freezers, little pastry area, and this is our balcony where we just enjoy the air. We're hearing, are they jets? Yeah. Can you see a way to peace? I myself work with a lot of Muslims and there are a lot of people that I care about and they care about me. I think we need to look eye to eye and just talk. So it's very warming, it's like another house. And all Israel are sending you packages with clothes and food. And Adam's one of thousands of evacuees, now in hotels, but still at risk. The sirens have sounded, there's an alert. 
everybody's been told to go to the shelters. You no, know, it's, it's nothing for us. We live in the in the south. You know, it's very regular things for us. The former soldier led the fight to protect his kibbutz, a community called near Ram, one of the first attacked. I took my pistol, got my ceramic vest, and the other thing is cigarettes. We start to kill everyone that came into the fence between 10 to 15 terrorists. I ran into them, stood and, and, and shot and killed, including a bullet to the head. And they were very close. What's going through your mind? My mind is regular. I'm a warrior, I'm a fighter, this is who I am. I want to tell you that I don't want Israeli soldiers go in Gaza because they, they want us to do that. They got traps in here, and this will be wrong. I want Gaza flat, flat Gaza. I don't want, want to see it flattened from I the want air. It flat from the air, yeah. The beautiful beachfront here. It's really quiet tonight. There are just a handful of people out, but Israel's skies are very active. There are planes, sirens, and there have been more rockets landing from Gaza and from Lebanon too. It's lasted for six days now, but the assault on this country is not over. Dan Johnson reporting from Tel Aviv and also from a Jewish settlement in the occupied West Bank. Well, as we heard a few moments ago, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held a joint news conference with the visiting US Secretary of State Antony Blinken. America's top diplomat vowed that his country would always back Israel. This must be a moment for moral clarity. The failure to unambiguously condemn terrorism puts at risk not only people in Israel, but people everywhere. Look at what just happened. Individuals from 36 countries killed or missing in the aftermath of Hamas' attacks. Europe, Asia, Africa, the Americas... No region has escaped Hamas's bloody reach. Anyone who wants peace and justice must condemn Hamas's reign of terror. But while Mr Blinken was keen to show solidarity with Israel, his visit also signals how worried the US is about how regional tensions could escalate. Our Middle East correspondent is Yolande Nell. This is a visit which has uh, several purposes. I mean, the U.S. Secretary of State came. He uh, patted Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, on the back and said, we're not going anywhere. So there was that message, first of all, that the solidarity. Um, There have also been warnings in that press conference that some precautions must be taken to avoid harming civilians of every nationality. Uh, Mr. Blinken saying, we mourn the loss of every civilian life. And he said, too, that Washington was working closely with Israel to try to secure the release of people taken hostage by Hamas. Of course, they include soldiers and civilians, including uh, women and children, uh, some very young children. And there's another purpose too, and that's the fact that this conflict could widen, as you you mentioned, that he wants to make sure that Israel has the armaments it needs. That's something that the US has been worried about, and we know that there were some supplies that came in overnight, according to the Israelis. You know, there is a big fear here that the powerful Iran-backed Hezbollah militant group in neighboring Lebanon to the north could get involved. Uh, Just yesterday, there were two missiles fired across at Israeli army posts, and they responded, the Israeli military, with artillery fire. There's all the time this fear that this could escalate, that also you'd have other fronts perhaps involved as the the occupied West Bank is really uh, simmering as well. And in a sign of how serious these fears are, we we saw the Saudi Arabian de facto ruler, Mohammed bin Salman, speaking on the phone with the Iranian president, uh, both men expressing support for the Palestinian people. Yeah, I think this was a a big move and it shows how things have changed in the past week. You know, uh, it's not very long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, that we had Mohammed bin Salman, the de facto leader uh, in Saudi Arabia, saying that every day we get closer to a normalization deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia, brokered by the US. And this, if it ever happened, would have meant a, a big shift in the region because Saudi Arabia is such a powerful Arab and Islamic country. It's interesting the timing of this call between the the, the two leaders because, you know, it was back in March that um, we know that Saudi Arabia and Iran agreed to resume their ties in a deal negotiated by China, the U.S. rival, after seven years of of hostility, which added so much to the the instability in the Gulf area and the sense of insecurity. And it's also a, a rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran that has really 
helped to fuel conflicts in the region from, from Yemen through to Syria. But these calls came as the Israeli airstrikes were underway. I mean, Mohammed bin Salman did reiterate that Saudi Arabia rejected targeting civilians in any way, but there was strong uh, talk here of the, the need to end war crimes against Palestine. That, those were the words of the Iranian state media. Uh, and meanwhile, briefly, there are two million people in Gaza, half of them children, under siege, no water, no fuel, no electricity, What's been done to try to resolve this? Because Israel's saying it's not going to ease its siege until hostages are released. Uh, that's right. And, you know, Egypt and the UN have been hoping uh, that they could negotiate some kind of a pause in fighting, even if it was just for an, a few hours to allow emergency supplies into Gaza, especially ahead of any Israeli ground invasion. But uh, that was really ruled out by Israeli ministers earlier on. Yoland now. <laughs> Still to come, we go to Haiti, where violence is so extreme that aid delivery depends on talking to armed gangs. Knowing us and accepting uh, our, our presence, this is why when we travel on motorbikes, we, we go with the big banners of Red Cross and they say, Croix Rouge, OK. From global current affairs to art, science and culture, the documentary from the BBC World Service tells the world's stories. Search for The Documentary wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Welcome back to the Global News Podcast. Let's move away from Israel and Gaza and head to Poland, where campaigning ahead of this weekend's election is drawing to a close. It's a close-run race and the rhetoric has at times been brutal. The right-wing Law and Justice Party is looking to win an unprecedented third term in office and it's tried to paint the main opposition party, Civic Coalition, as a threat to Poland's national security. But the opposition says the real threat is from the government and to democracy itself. It's calling this the most important election since 1989 and the end of communism. From Gdansk in Poland, our Eastern Europe correspondent, Sarah Rainsford, reports. In the old Lenin shipyard in Gdansk, a crowd gathers for a mix of music and political debate. Three decades ago, this is where the striking workers of solidarity fought for change that eventually brought an end to communist rule. Today, many Poles worry that the rights and freedoms they won then are in danger. Hi, my name is Julia Landowska. I'm a 23-year-old activist and student from Gdańsk, Poland. For me and for many young people, it is a very important election because we're deciding here if we're going back to being a democratic country. That's why it's uh, more important to go and vote and decide about our future. Jurka Kafka, działaczka społeczna i studentka psychologii. The event slogan is, in our day, things will be better. Because Yulia and her friends have a long list of concerns about the Law and Justice Party that's run Poland for eight years now. They include its near-total ban on abortion, the politicisation of Poland's courts and limits on free speech. Yulia ended up in court recently for swearing at the government. I feel like they're supposed to just make the activists more scared and just, uh, encourage them to go to protest. And that's why I feel I know that my case is 100% political. <laughs> With the results still too close to call, there is a flurry of last-minute campaigning here, like this opposition candidate out leafleting in a Gdansk park. My name is Jarek Wałęsa. I represent the Civic Platform in Gdańsk, Poland. This candidate's name is his calling card. His father is Lech Walesa, the man who led Solidarity and was then Poland's first democratically elected president. Some people talk about this election as the most important since 1989. Is that, is that how you feel? It's uh, quite fundamental if you think about it. You know, we have to make sure that we win this election to reform everything that has been uh, destroyed in the past eight years. I, I, and I know that's a strong word destruction but if you look at what has been uh, done to our democracy we we took a, a huge step back in all the the things we have accomplished in the past 30 years down the road from gdansk elblonk is solid government voting territory <laughs> come to the weekend market here there are tables piled high with potatoes and pumpkins we're here because uh, there's a group of people campaigning for votes for the local law and justice 
party candidate? Uh, for me, the most important is uh, security. What do you mean by security? You mean from Russia? From Yes, it's true. Uh, from Russia, the security for future in, it's the most important for us. These people started to solve uh, many problems in Poland. Uh, f- 500 plus uh, so per, per money, month. Money for children. Per month. Yeah. Uh, but, but now it will be 800 zlotys. In the Poland is amount to solve many things. The opposition are saying that democracy is in danger in Poland. We didn't uh, accept this uh, okay. opinion. Our situation in our country is the, the, the most important for us and democracy is uh, good for us. That was Sarah Rainsford speaking to voters in Poland. So lawless and violent has the situation become in Haiti that aid agencies are having to cooperate with gangs in order to deliver desperately needed humanitarian help. That's according to the Director General of the ICRC, Robert Mardini, who says his organisation has to engage with hundreds of gangs that rule over much of the country. He spoke to our Latin America's online editor, Vanessa Buschluta, after a recent visit to Haiti. He told me that in his 27 years with the ICRC, he had rarely seen such a toxic combination of factors hitting the communities living in deprived areas. Not only is there a dire lack of infrastructure, there's streets flooded with sewage-infested waters, there's also the lack of security, the fact that so many gangs roam the streets and that there's little police presence and that these communities have to live almost under siege from these gangs. So, so given that, how did he say aid agencies can even function there? He said that aid agencies have to deal with the realities on the ground. So when there are hundreds of gangs in control, what they have to do is they have to engage with these gangs and get their acceptance to even deliver the aid. It's overwhelming the number of those groups. I cannot pretend today that we have a dialogue with all of them. We can reach many of them. But in Cité Soleil, we are in a regular, uh, robust dialogue with the two coalitions, GPEP and G9, GENA. And um, th- this is the key feature of our security management, being accepted, uh, knowing us uh, and accepting uh, our, our presence. This is why when we travel on motorbikes, we, we go with the big banners of Red Cross and they say, Croix Rouge, OK. So a very, very difficult situation there. We've been reporting for years on how dire the situation is in Haiti. Did Mr. Mardini see anything positive on the horizon? He did say that when you see the smiles of people when they receive the aid in areas that have seen absolutely no help for all these years, it makes it all worthwhile. And he also stressed that he wanted to shine a spotlight on the pressing needs of Haitians. And in fact, he told me that the ICRC would step up its aid, in particular the kits that they give with basic medication and basic trauma uh, kits to the hospitals in the region. They also support a hospital that they run in conjunction with Médecins Sans Frontières. And so there is aid coming. But he also had words of warning, which were that if the international community forgets about Haiti, this could spread beyond the borders of the country. Vanessa Buschluter. The Japanese government says it's applying for a dissolution order for the Unification Church, a controversial sect which has been under the spotlight since the assassination of the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. A formal request is expected to be filed in court on Friday. Will Leonardo reports. This is the culmination of a year-long inquiry into the Unification Church, a conservative sect also known as the Moonies after its Korean founder, Sun Myung Moon. It's been accused of extracting huge donations from its Japanese followers, at times as atonement for bad ancestral karma, including Japan's colonial-era treatment of Korea. Story after story has emerged of families being bankrupted, not least the mother of Shinzo Abe's killer, who said he targeted the former Japanese prime minister for his alleged links to the church. In a strange turn of events, his story garnered sympathy for a murder suspect, while also fueling distrust of politicians as almost half of all Japanese MPs revealed their interactions with the sect. A dissolution order would mean the church loses its status as a religious organisation and its tax benefits, although it will be allowed to continue operating. 
Will Leonardo. The highly anticipated feature film about Taylor Swift's sellout concert tour has had its red carpet premiere in Hollywood. The film was recorded during the US leg of her Eras tour and has already broken records for advanced ticket sales. Our North America correspondent, Peter Bowes, was at the premiere. Welcome to the Eras tour! The phenomenon that is Taylor Swift, a cultural touchstone, music's biggest name and soon to be queen of the box office. This shopping mall was completely closed down to stage the red carpet premiere. Security was intense, as was the level of excitement amongst the Swifties who were lucky enough to get a ticket. I'm just like overwhelmed right now. I'm like shaking a little bit, a little bit anxious. My stomach hurts, um, but like in the best way possible. Listening to her music and reminding me that, um, you know, having a bad reputation can't make you afraid to talk. They really mean it. She means that much to me. This is what the Swifties have been waiting for, the red carpet entrance to the cinema with Taylor Swift waiting inside to screen for the first time her new movie. Up until the last minute, the premiere was shrouded in secrecy. Taylor Swift's eventual entrance, more than many of her fans had dared to hope for. The film's already broken records with more than $100 million in ticket sales well before opening night. It's the classic Taylor effect. The economic juggernaut that rolls into town when Taylor Swift is performing is infectious. There's a tangible benefit for local businesses on a scale that's never been seen before. The success of the tour is largely down to the music and an intensely loyal fan base. Welcome to the acoustic set. The film, which runs for almost three hours, could easily be in Los Angeles. And that's all from us for now, but there will be a new edition of the Global News Podcast later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. You can also find us on X at Global News Pod. This edition was mixed by Gabriel O'Regan. The producer was Vanessa Heaney. The editor is Karen Martin. I'm Janat Jalil. Until next time, goodbye. What in the World is the podcast helping you make sense of what's happening in the world. What in the world is net zero and are we actually on track to achieving it? Is the wastewater from Fukushima dangerous? So you can understand more about what in the world is going on when you read the daily headlines. Why is there a North Korea and a South Korea? It's supposed to be temporary. Why is palm oil considered bad? The amount of land we need to grow it. What in the World from the BBC World Service. Find it wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Thank you.